lights on the person's face to get a camera view, and then having those down in front of you in the total darkness, trying to uh, unravel what it is you were going to say. But they now have a light here, and the light over there, and of course, up. I also noticed on the board behind uh, that Anne was presented as Anne, but I'm presented as Alexander. And when I answer the phone and someone says, hello, who is this Alexander? Either I'm just selling insurance or some, somebody has the wrong number. If my name is Sasha, I mean, it's Alexander, but I respond to Sasha for sure. And Alexander is a, is a formality that I've never quite gotten used to. So, Sasha is fine. <laughs> Oh, I speak a little louder for the translator. All right, I'll try that. Here we go. Oops. history of the psychedelic drugs, some of the present status, and some of the future potentials of this area of drugs. And the second hour will spend uh, in uh, questions and answers, which in, in many ways is almost more comfortable, because this gives us the knowledge of uh, awareness of what the audience is interested in, and then we can address our answers to that particular interest. Um, let me put in here that please, uh, start right now writing down the questions you want to ask. Because remember, the worst thing is to get somebody uh, to have the first question. Nobody wants to be the first one. <laughs> so uh, start writing them down now. <laughs> well, I'd like to introduce two people. Uh, you may very well know them both. Uh, the first of them is a fellow by the name of Louis Levine who was very early in the area of the, the uh, pharmacology of mescaline, back somewhere in about 1920s or 1930s. And he used the, uh, the, the he wrote a book about the uh, Fantastica, about the different states of mind that are created by, uh, psychotropic states of mind created by drugs, such as excitantia, which is a status of, of excitement and stimulation, and we have a lot of natural plant and synthetic compounds that play this role from the from the nature of the, such things as uh, cocaine. Um, we had the synthetic uh, methamphetamine, amphetamine stimulants in general, materials that produce a, a state of usually heart acceleration, of excitement, of alertness, a lack of sleepness, uh, and those people who are normally not too vital find these drugs to be extremely useful because they put them in, a, in a, an advanced capability state, which is uh, their, their desire and not part of their natural uh, doings. The disadvantage is that once you have found you can artificially generate this state, very often people wish to maintain that, and it does indeed disrupt uh, a lot of the human pharmacology. Uh, then he talked about the inebriating drugs and materials that put you out of the normal status, but into one of a little bit of uh, alcohol-like intoxication. There's alcohol, there's ether, uh, chloroform at that time. The use of chloroform as an, as an intoxicant was quite popular. They had the term chlorophyllomania, in which people would drink chloroform to get that intoxicated state, and then eventually go unconscious. And of course, the synthetics are plentiful in this general area. Then they had the sedating drugs, the materials that caused you to go a little bit away from consciousness, eventually lose consciousness entirely, the hypnotica, uh, the, the sedating, I should say, the opium, the sleeping pills that we now know of, uh, and quite generally used pharmacologically. Also, he had the, what he called the hypnotica state, which was a state of, it has hypnosis, but uh, in our current vocabulary, usually these would be drugs that would cause an amnesia, cause you to lose awareness of where you are. Uh, we have this hypotalamy atropine world that was talked about yesterday. Uh, drugs that cause a loss of awareness of exactly what you are doing, where you are. Uh, the datura, uh, uh, the, the henbane, the uh, gypsum weed, the belladonna type drugs would fit in this category. And the active ingredient is hypotalamy. 
the drugs that I want to talk about, and the reason I think many people are here, is what he called the fantastic drug. These are the psychedelic drugs, and they are the ones that are a complete, of, of greatest interest to me, and I think to a number of you, to this more or less the theme of, of, this, um, of this meeting. The second person is a person not as well known, uh, a person, a writer, Stephen Wolfram, who uh, wrote a book called the, the New Kind of Science. And it's on the basis of my meeting with him and being, I was a, a co-lecturer on a stage with him in a little town of, of Camden, Maine, uh, about two years ago, in which he got, into a, he got into a very interesting aspect of his style of understanding science, that anything that is creating, that is new, and will become increasingly in public and in, in individual intention will grow, will change in an exponential way. In which, for example, you have things that get larger by orders of magnitude, by orders of by exponents, from the from the normal to the kilo to the mega to the giga to the tera, every one of these being three orders of magnitude greater. Or things on the other side that are are, are as it gets smaller and more multiplied and more finally divided. You have things that go down into the micro, into the nano, into the, into the pico, into the fento, where everyone is getting smaller and smaller, and more and more, more of them, and more detail. This is a, a, his concept that all things of interest in this area, in, in, uh, of scientific curiosity, of stimulation to the imagination, of, of creating new tools and techniques with our modern development, would follow these, these, this rule of exponential uh, growth. And indeed, I would like to do that because I believe the concept of the psychedelic drug fits this category, this concept of Putin very, very well. You have, for example, I look about it in terms of the talk I gave in vain was based on this, this general idea and I want to elaborate more upon it here. The, for example, let's go back 100 years. In the year of 1900, 1905, uh, at that time, really, in our Western world, our Western scientific world, we had only two psychedelic drugs. We had, you had cannabis, the marijuana, the hash of ancient, ancient times, was known in, in, in the Western world. And you had the peyote, mescaline, was known. And there were no other psychedelic drugs known in Western science. The, if you go into the wilds of, of South America or into the ancient cultures, you'll find many of them. But they're not known to the Western scientists. And so this is the, 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 the window through which I wish to look, is the, the Western world of, of chemistry, of pharmacology, of medicine, and see what psychedelic drugs there are with, uh, and how they change in number with time. We had two at that time. Um, the uh, marijuana structure of the, any of the active components of marijuana were totally unknown. They, they only knew them as the plant, as the extract, as the hashish, as the various aspects of that plant. And in the peyote, the little, one of the beautiful examples of them upstairs here in the, in the, in the exhibit hall, uh, the, the active component was known to be mescaline, but the structure was not known, it had never been synthesized, it was not synthesized until about 1819, when the structure was first identified. But it had been known and explored for 25 years before that. The Hefter was one of the main uh, explorers, isolators and explorers of it, and Louis de was one of the more vocal uh, uh, lecturer and uh, presenter of that information to the public. Well, there were many that were known in that known, as I say, in the in the jungle, so to speak, but uh, were not known to the Western world. Leap ahead about 50, 60 years. We're in now in the middle of the of the 20th century, the 1950, 1960. Now we have many more that are known at that time in the plant area. You have uh, DMT, for example, uh, found in many plants. DMT is, a, is, a, is not acting orally, but it's certainly acting in, in snuffings and, and injections and are using medical tools and object, object smoking. Uh, many plants are now known to have DMT as a principal alkaloid. Actually, DMT, uh, dimethyltryptamine, uh, was first synthesized in the, the early 1930s by Mansky in Canada. Had no idea of its pharmacology. Pharmacology was unknown. It's not until the early 1950s that it was found to be a component of one of the, of the snuffs of South America. And from that, it suddenly became a, a, a point of, of medical exploration. Um, there was the uh, Sea Zara, 
who is a, a chemist I, knew, I know rather well, he's still alive, at NIDA, who went into this and synthesized the, the said dimethyltryptamine, you mean the diethyltryptamine, the propyltryptamine, that butyltryptamine kept making the chains longer and longer. He discovered that the others, the longer chain ones, were orally active, and he explored four or five of these compounds and published on this information. He also made a halotryptamine, but he never explicitly told how he made it. It's an interesting story there, I'm going to get into it. Um, but he uh, had um, uh, made the compounds, had found their biological activity. He found that anything larger than DMT was orally active. And as you got larger and heavier, you got less and less potent. So that was the first contribution synthetically in this, in this whole area. There is the uh, area that was talked about some yesterday of psilocybin, psilocybin, the mushrooms, the active mushrooms, the shrooms that they call them in the, in the United States in the, in the slide. Where you have uh, the psilocybin cubensis, the uh, uh, work of Gordon Wasson of trying to bring uh, bringing the mushrooms back into the, into the uh, United States from, from the Oaxaca area, the Ibero Indian, the Ibero, uh, Ibero Indians, right of the uh, Oaxaca area, and this led to uh, work of, uh, was done, much of it was done uh, by, by Hoffman, of the synthesis of psilocybin, of psilocin, and in Sandoz laboratories where he worked, they had made uh, the uh, diethyl, I believe the dipropyl, I know the diethyl homolog, and these materials are orally active, they're the components of the mushroom, and uh, they had made the psilocin, which is the de-esterified compound, and the NNI ethyl. There are another plant source in this middle of, of this last century were what are called MGS, morning glory seeds. Morning glory seeds became quite popular. No one knew quite what they were. These from, again, from Mexico, uh, the uh, Ipamia violacea, you have the uh, Hawaiian, the baby Hawaiian wood rose, Argeria nervosa. These are materials that contain iridot alkaloids in them. But no one had worked out exactly what was in them and why they were biologically active. But a great popularity sprung forth in the, I believe it was the early, late 1950s, early 60s, of consuming handfuls of argyria, spoonfuls of the, uh, of the uh, Ipamia, uh, handfuls of seeds, maybe 100 seeds or 200 seeds for a, for a trip. These are, I mean, plant sources. At this time, there were also a number of synthetic materials that came forth in the market on the market into the scientific community, I should say, in the area of psychedelic drugs. The major initiator of the synthetics were the Hoffman's work on LSD. Uh, LSD was first uh, synthesized, I believe, in 1938, and it was not known to be active, to, no, no searching for active, it was looking for other things in Sandoz. And it was about five years later, in the 1943, I believe it was, that Hoffman, they say accidentally, we don't know, he, he would not use any term other than accidental, uh, got exposed to a small amount of it in him. And the experience, of course, is famous for the bicycle ride and the, uh, uh, the popularization and the uh, maybe widely known in the scientific community and the medical community, the intense potency of, of LSD as a compound. Uh, LSD is, uh, that even as you, well, as you know, as many people know, uh, 50, 100, 150 microgram levels. He had synthesized at that time about four or five other materials. Uh, the isomers that were not active, but he made the N-methyl, the 1-methyl, the 2-methyl, the 1-2-bromo compounds that had biological activity, and perhaps there are a total of four or five compounds made at Sandoz that were uh, known to be biologically active or even explored biologically. Another material that was first explored in Canada, an outgrowth synthetically of mesalin, uh, explored in Canada as ways of interfering with, with uh, the, the visual effects of, of uh, a spinning wheel that had lights and colors on it. And they tried to use this as a way of distorting the color sense, material called TMA. Trimethoxy amphetamine. This is mescaline with a methyl group hooked onto the alpha position. So it's really an amphetamine chain, and uh, it was called TMA by the people of Canada. And I had made the compound two, I called it TMA. In my case, I was looking at it as having mescaline like action. And it is indeed about twice as potent as mescaline. And uh, it's a basis for which I made a number of compounds, 
if one card it makes it better, the two and three and four should be better, better, better. I made it up to about eight card, eight tom, eight carbons, and only the one carbon was the active with all the rest are totally uninteresting. But anyway, uh, TMA in this area was the first in synthetics that followed the general area of investment. Also person down in Los Angeles at the University of California, UCLA, Gordon Alice, had made the compound, the uh, basic amphetamine compound with a methylene doxy group on it called MDA. And it was patented by, I forget the company, patented by someone as an appetite suppressant, which indeed it was, but it never went commercial because it turned you on. And that was not the thing you wanted a pharmaceutical company wanted their product to do. So the whole area was dropped. But it was patented as, a, uh, as an anorexic, and uh, it was uh, a psychedelic known at that time. One other thing in the same area, about 1950-something, uh, both Gordon Alice in Los Angeles and I had made a material we called MMDA, methoxymethylene doxyamphetamine. The interesting story there, and that he had made the material, I knew that, and he knew that I had made the material. We both had not determined its activity yet, but we were going to do so, and we planned to meet uh, in January of the year. It turns out in the end of November of the previous year, he died an unexpected death. And uh, it died of a diabetes, diabetes uh, problem. And he was a pharmacologist who had worked out the use of insulin against diabetes problems in general. And uh, that he should die of this problem, I found to be very, very challenging, very mysterious. Because he was also working on tryptamines, as I was working on tryptamines, and I had this fantasy that he had gotten into a tryptamine that was very lethal. And he, I would like very much to have met him before he died to find out what he was working on so I could stay away from that particular area. And we never, communication was never established. But we did have, he was, he was and I were the earlier studies of M MDA, uh, the methoxy amphetamine. And uh, that is the, that's basically what was known in the 1950s. And total of all these compounds I'm talking about adds up to perhaps uh, 20 compounds. So now let's take ahead to the present day where we are now. We're now 50 years later yet. The number of plants have really become quite a bit more extensive. Not at the same growth as before, but still quite real. Uh, many cacti have become active on the scene. Uh, uh, everyone knows, uh, most people know about the uh, many examples of upstairs, the well-known uh, Sanfrede Pedro, the uh, Trachycerus pachinoi. There are many Trachycerus cactus that have been explored, uh, most of them analytically and chemically, but some of them in human trials. And the number of cactus that contain mescaline is in excess of 50. There are actually 50, or currently known about 55 cactus species that contain mescaline. <coughs> uh, other cactus from I've worked with in the, uh, in the uh, outside of the Trichocerus. You have Trichocerus I saw upstairs, the Macrodonus, you have uh, the Terchechii, uh, various variants of Trichocerus, very rich, uh, well, the Terchechii samples is a good one I got from uh, the northern part of Argentina, northwestern Argentina, in which the uh, Terchechii has, I ran its analysis on it, the major alkaloid is n methyl mescaline, interestingly. A compound extremely similar, it has the same relationship to mescaline, n methyl mescaline to mescaline, as MDMA has to MDA. Then it has a methyl group on a nitrogen. And this compound has been found in some other cacti, but this is the major alkaloid in this extremely potent northwestern Argentine cactus, the Terchechii. And the compound has never been tried in man. It's totally unexplored clinically. The second most active, the second most prevalent compound in that cactus is mescaline itself, which is probably the reason that it's active. There's also an dimethyl mescaline known as trichocerium, it's not an active compound. Three, a mono, a three dimethoxy uh, phenethylene compounds, none of them known to be active, and there's a seventh alkaloid I've not yet uncovered the structure, I've not yet uncovered the structure of, but this compound is from a, from a trichocerus, I say a South American trichocerus, that is not much explored and should be more and more exploration. It gives rise to the compound and methylmesylin that should be explored as a potential psychotomy, as a potential psychedelic, and it has never been. Uh, other cactus, when I worked with the sun, not the pachycerus, but the, uh, not the trichocerus, but the pachycerus genus, uh, is pachycerus pringlii, which comes from Baja, California. 
a, clown, a, a cactus around 50, 60 feet tall. The whole story of how the active component of it was discovered is a, quite a different, different story and too long for the moment. But these are examples of cacti that are pharmacologically active and carry active components. The, uh, there's quite a bit of discussion I've heard about salvia divinorum, <coughs> the uh, active sage, the Mexican sage, uh, a case of a, of, a, of a plant that is very active, the active component of uh, uh, Sal Salvadoran A uh, is active in the hundred micro, hundreds of micrograms level uh, and uh, extremely complex molecule. It's not an alkaloid, it's a, it's a terpene, it's a, 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 a sesquiterpene. Sesquiterpene, no, it's a diterpene. It's a diterpene. It's not one that's going to be easy to synthesize. It has seven asymmetric centers, and you must observe all seven of these higher uh, positions to get the right compound. It has not been synthesized and will not be for a while. But these are the plants that are now currently in the inventory of psychedelics. In the synthetics is where it has really gone very, very far up. <coughs> synthetics have really gotten out of hand very nicely. Uh, in the phenethylamine, no, 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 no. Oh. In the phenethylamines, the bulk of the, the, the pilot compound from which synthetics have been made has been mescaline. I mentioned the TMA was known, I, uh, the Canadian work in my work back in the 50s. Uh, that led to a host of materials. For example, um, you can move the trimethoxyamphetamine, you can move the methoxy to five different positions. TMA, TMA2, I call it TMA6. TMA2, TMA6, are the compounds of the methoxies at 245 and 246 positions. Uh, both are much more potent than mescaline, about 10, 15 times more potent than mescaline. And the 245 is the one in which I really focus my attention because it's easily made. It is not natural, that particular compound. It's not in nature, but it's easily made. And once you have something easily made, of course, a mediocre chemist can really have a great time with it. And I enjoyed my thoroughly putting all kinds of other groups on the molecule. And all the things I developed on the, on the TMA2 would also apply to TMA6 in that area is totally unexplored. Not totally, but largely unexplored. So here's an area that's going to explode into the future sometime in the next year or decade or century. Someone's going to say, hey, what about making the two, four, two or six things of all the two or fives you've known, and you're going to have a host of 100 new compounds that are biologically active, but they have not been made yet. In the two, in the, in the two four five, uh, made a number of homologs of it, and I found the four position was a, was a functional position that gave spark and fire to the molecule. And so I put the ethoxy there, methoxy, making methoxy, propoxy, all kinds of derivatives, branch chains, all branches of compounds, the larger they got, the less potent the compounds were. But it showed me that this was the active site of, the, of this molecule. So the obvious thing is replacing the methoxy with something else. So I had this idea of, of putting on, in place of the methoxy, a methyl group. A methyl group is a little bit smaller. It has the advantage that it's more compact. If this material, I felt, uh, it has an has advantage, disadvantage is it cannot be metabolized off very easily, whereas the methoxy group can be taken off very easily. The methyl group cannot be. So I had this fantasy, if it is, goes to the same receptor site, as an active compound, then it'll go into that place and be a very potent material. If it goes in as not an active compound, and it goes into that receptor site and blocks the receptor site, then it would be a, not only an inactive compound, but if human psychopharmacological problems, schizophrenia, uh, mental disturbance, is due to some endogenous poison that goes to that receptor site, this could be a therapy for that poisoning. It might be used in treatment of mental illness. So it's either going to be an active psychedelic, or it's going to be a potentially valid um, anecdotal treatment for a psychedelic or for a natural uh, altered state that's not one in Medicaid. So I made the compound, I think I cannot lose. Either way, it's going to be uh, an interesting development. It turned out to be a very potent psychedelic. I made it deal, uh, called DOM because I did oxy, I took the oxygen away, but left the methyl on this oxymethyl. And the compound uh, was, I made that about 19, oh, probably 1965 or in the mid 60s. The next thing I knew, there was a compound on the street about a, a, a six months later called SDP. And it turned out that was the compound. I had given a lecture at Johns Hopkins a, a few months earlier 
and some of Peary had been picked up the molecule, the structure, how to make it, and made it, and made it, the Haight Ashbury in the 1960s uh, had a great deal of his STP available. It was being sold as a, as a, as a uh, psychedelic drug, which it is. The disadvantage is no one knew that it, it its potency, knew the fact it was a very slow onset and a very long experience, and they made it in 20 milligram tablets, which is absurd because five milligrams is a very excellent dose. And people were taking tablets, they made multiple tablets because they were told it was like LSD, and people were overdosing on them. But the material as STP, which is the name in the United States for an oil additive, was used at that time just as a trick. Originally, the STP, they said, stood for stop the police. Uh, then the police used it for too stupid to puke as their way of, of going after the, the drug. And actually, truth was named for, for an oil additive that had nothing to do with, with uh, pharmacology at all. But from that, I went on the ethyl compound, the propyl DOET, DOPR, and then the, oh, the simple things like the halides, the DOB, bromo, DOC, toporo, DOI, iodine compounds, all extremely potent and all very long-lived. About this point, I got quite interested in going back to the phenethylamines and did that and took the extra methyl group off the chain and since they were the two carbon analogs of these, these rather potent uh, deal, deal compounds, I call them two C's for two carbon. And this led to a whole host of other compounds like two CB, two CB for two C, two carbon bromo, two CI, two C, all, the whole family that got carried away with the sulfur compounds, they called them for sulfur, they're thio compounds, two CT, two, three, four, seven, I went to about 25 or so. Uh, and many of them are active in very potent compounds. All of these were less potent than the three carbon materials, but all of them were shorter lived, faster onset, and they, you could get out of them in a matter of a few hours instead of having to wait until the next day. So these, these became quite, quite interesting areas of exploration. Uh, there were, uh, now we have things like what we call the flies. Uh, these are compounds that are three ring systems, phenethylamine with two rings hooked on either side of it. Compounds that I call also the dragonflies, which are the ones that are aromatic, and these materials are orally active. No, the dragonflies are not there currently. The, uh, the non-dragon ordinary flies are orally active, and the potencies are less than a milligram. So here, a new whole new sub subdivision of the phenethylamines uh, that are are very interesting and are very worth exploring. The other other side of the coin is the area of the tryptamines. The DMT became the starting material of the post. I mentioned the Stephen Zara's work with the ethyl and the propyl, the butyl. But the compounds extended now into a branch chain things. I made a number of methyl isopropyls. Repke made a number of other comparable analogs. A number of our chemical allies were all working together, making these various things and exploring them amongst one, one another. Uh, the compounds with the silos and psilocybin are, are the tryptamines with the hydroxy group in the four position. And all the compounds of branch chain DMTs with the hydroxy group there are orally active. And the beauty of it is, uh, by esterifying that hydroxy group, we make the acetone compounds that are even more potent and are faster onset and shorter lived. And many of them are very, very, uh, quite free of, of, of physical disruption and uh, uh, toxic symptomology. Another group that's very, very interesting was the groups with the 5-methoxy group. Uh, the 5 methoxy on the tryptamines is where the 4-hydroxy is on the phenethylamines is the point of manipulation. You put that methoxy group in the 5 position, 5 methoxy DMT is known uh, nature, I did not mention it before, it's found in some plants, it's also found in some uh, uh, frog venoms. The idea of frog smoking became quite popular a few years ago. You take the venom off of Bufo alvarius and make a little ball of it smoking. The very, very dramatic turn on and became very popular in the term of smoking frogs. Um, these uh, five methoxies are more potent. Again, other than the dimethyl, they are all orally active, and there must be some 15 or 20 of these that have been explored clinically and are in the literature. So, altogether, uh, uh, I would say comfortably with 100, over 100 phenethylamines and uh, something like 50 or more tryptamines. I would say, as of the present time, there are probably 200 psychedelic drugs that are known to be active in man. Uh, this, this is, a lot of this is very well recorded. I would recommend strongly, if you're not familiar with the location of Arrowhead, E-R-O-W-I-D. Arrowhead is a remarkable site 
for information, good and bad, about many of these drugs. They are receivers of many uh, anonymous uh, statements about drugs, uh, their potency, new drugs, their activities, uh, the goods and the bads. A lot of it is, is fiction and is uh, fraud. A lot of it is very real and very valid. And you have to use judgment. They are very good at using judgment whether to accept or not accept a given statement about a new chemical as being toxic or interesting or a turn on or dangerous or curious uh, to try. So I recommend strongly the uh, search of the, of the system of heroin. Good. Uh, basically, that's where we are now. I mentioned that the, um, a lot of materials being done, I know of materials being worked on here in Europe uh, some in Sweden, uh, some in Switzerland, uh, some in Spain, uh, some in England, some in Northern Germany, right around here. People are in continual communication uh, with me about what they are doing, what they have found out, what they what they're doing, what they have found out, and uh, ask questions. I turn the information over the area if it's appropriate. I try to stay away from anything that be could be interpreted as being. Uh, working together with someone who's in the business of making drugs for sale, the internet system availability of drugs is staggering. But I, this, I have, no, I have no wish to get anywhere near the contact of this. But I do know that there is an ever-increasing number of these being explored and being shared amongst friends. We have now, if we have two, uh, two drugs known in 1900, and 20 drugs known in 1950 and 60, and 200 drugs known today, we are in the exponential, exponential growth, 2 to 20 to 200 every 50 years. So I would say without any hesitation that in the year 2050, which I will probably not see, but you very well might see, I'd be very to say great confidence there will be 2,000 psychedelic drugs known to be active in man. And I see no idea, no, I have no hesitation, but believe me, you'll get even more involved, and more complex after that. So it's a, it's a growing, growing area of interest. I find it a fascinating interest area. And uh, I want to say very much of the rest of what's going on. Thank you very much.